welcome to module six of uh, hand in hand dementia care training. This one is being with a person with dementia making a difference. Isn't that really why we do this? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, none of us get paid enough. We all work too hard, but we do it so that we can make a difference, don't we? Isn't that why we do it? Mm -hmm. Somebody tell me your best story about making a difference with an elder that you've cared for. Um, I feel like I made quite a big difference. I worked over at another facility and um, there was this man and um, I reminded him of his granddaughter. So he would always call me Alyssa. And uh, I, his wife came every single evening and so we got to know each other pretty well. And a lot of times I would um, work third shift and so she would call me and she would say, well I just wanna make sure that you know he's okay. and. Whatnot. And so when um, he ended up passing away, and um, she sent me, or she, we went to his funeral, and um, their family sent me a thank you card for everything that they did, and um, and we still keep in touch, you know, today. She'll send me a Christmas card or whatnot. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, I think I did. I think I made some kind of difference. You know, oh. they were able to. Um, trust me, you know, and know that things okay and, you know, things we're going to get taken care of. So. so you mentioned several different things. First of all, you developed a relationship with not only the elder, but the family of the elder. Mm -hmm. And then you mentioned trust. Because it's not, have you ever had this with family members? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's not good. That, that doesn't help anybody. So how do we do this with the family? How do we get them to understand how important they are on our team? And when something goes wrong, involving them so that they can be part of the solution and not just the problem. Empathy. Empathy. Think about what they're going through. The family member of an elder with dementia grieves three times when the dementia diagnosis is given to them whatever that diagnosis might be, when they have to turn care over to someone else. Because many times promises have been made, I'll never put you in a nursing home. There we are back to put. I'll never, you, I'll never put you in a nursing home. I, I will take care of you forever. And then the third time they grieve is when that final journey happens. So if we can just bridge that gap and build that relationship, including trust, then we are all making a difference. I hope that you believe, when you walk out of here every day, that you believe that you have made a difference every day. Do you? Or do you just walk out tired? Sometimes. Sometimes we just <laughs> walked out, we just walk out tired. But sometimes we realize that we've done some little thing that didn't mean squat anybody else but it meant something to that elder. Okay so an overview of where we have been so far. Being with a person with dementia means that you have an understanding of the things from their perspective. They have fears, they have hurts, they have pains, they have broken relationships, they have all the things that we have. They have a disease that's affected their brain. That's all it is, is a disease that's affected their brain. We understand that being with them where they are is what is vital. It's just like um, Paco said earlier, we have to get into their life. We have to, to know where they are. We are recognizing them as a whole and unique individual. Their heart is still who they are. Their personality does not change. They may lose some inhibitions. They may say or do some things that we wish they didn't, but they're still who they are. We are building on their strengths. We don't care what they can't do anymore. Don't care, but we do care what they can do, and we don't want them to lose that ability, those abilities that they have, sooner than they need to. And then we need to connect with them. So the objectives for this module, you will be able to explain what it means to meet persons with dementia where they are. 
you will be able to recognize the importance of focusing on the strengths and the abilities of people with dementia. Don't treat them like they have nothing to give. Give them a purpose. You will be able to identify ways to connect with people with dementia where they are and you will be able to recognize your role in making a difference in the lives of people. Just as a review, so the symptoms of dementia, what dementia actually affects? Memory, they have long-term memory until very late in the disease. That's the ability for memory. Concentration, they have the ability to concentrate for 10 to 15 minutes at the most, but they have the ability to do that for 10 to 15 minutes. So make those meaningful moments. Orientation. Go where they are, because they are somewhere. We are all somewhere. Go where they are, use that as your orientation. Language, you're gonna to have to watch them. Pick out what their nonverbal communication is, because they're watching yours. Judgment, they don't always have good judgment. So sometimes we have to be help them with that judgment just to keep them safe. Visual spatial skills, we need to put some things in place that will help them with that. And sequencing, we need to follow their patterns. They have procedural memory because it's associated with long-term memory, which is their strongest. Don't make them do it your way. You help them do it theirs. Okay, so the goal of this lesson would be to understand what it means to meet people with dementia where they are. You have to accept their reality. Their perception, their reality is always what they believe. You will not argue them into yours. And I will just promise you that your reality will not be right all the time. We don't always have the right answers. We have to know who they are as individuals. We have to know where they are in their dementia. You know, there's a multiple ways of, of um, staging dementia. Lots of people have stages. Uh, there's all kinds of ways to know, but you have to know not so much what the stage is, but what, what there is their condition and what can they do. Um, you have to be able to identify their needs and recognize and honor their strengths. Mrs. Johnson, it's me, Gloria. Come in. It's almost bedtime. Let's get your teeth brushed. I'll be back in a minute to check in on you. What did she do to help her get her teeth brushed? Reminded her. She reminded her. I didn't even see any setup. She just reminded her that she needs. So where is she in her dementia? Early stage. Early stage. I would say it's early stage. Mrs. Johnson, it's me, Gloria. It's almost bedtime. Let's get your teeth brushed. Okay, I'll check back on you. Mm, so this time, what did she do? Set up. So what stage do you think? Middle stages. Early to mid, yeah. She still did it by herself. Mm -hmm. And she let her do it by herself.
Mrs. Johnson, it's me, Gloria. It's almost bedtime. Let's get your teeth brushed. Oh, this way, Mrs. Johnson. Come with me. So this time, what did she do? She, her, she directed her, and obviously she was going to stay in there, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So I would say mid, mid-stage dementia here, you think? You yeah. agree? Here, Mrs. Johnson. Okay. Do you have two There you go. Here we go. Try it again. There you go. There you go. There. Mrs. Johnson, look at me. Ready? Cheer up. Look at me. Spit in the sink. Good job. Okay. Okay. Wanna do it again? Go ahead. Very good. Very good, Mrs. Johnson. Here, let me get you a towel. Good job. Great. Ready for bed? So what stage do you think? Late. late. I think late stage. Not end stage. No. End stage you're going to do it for her. But um, late stage, I love the way she approached it. She let her do what she could. She didn't, what, was it good oral care? No. Probably not as good as we would like to see. Maybe you need to do it twice a day instead of once or something like that but she did it herself. Yeah, I think probably late stage is right. Mrs. Johnson, it's me, Gloria. It's almost bedtime. Let's get your teeth brushed. Good job, Mrs. Johnson. All right, we're gonna spit, okay. There you go, good job. I'll get that. Okay, I got it. There you go, there you go. Here, let's wipe you up. right back. So, what do you think? End stage? End stage? Mm -hmm. I think so. She did not speak. Um, she had to have it done for her. So I counted 23. Anybody else add them up? Was it 23? So in a matter of 23 months, she went from pretty independent, queuing, to totally dependent. Did Alzheimer's disease in itself is a progressive neurodegenerative disease. So what you are doing for your person today 
will not be the same as it was yesterday, and it won't be the same that you do tomorrow. You have to adjust to their abilities because they change. So how did she adapt? She increased the help, right? The assistance that she gave. She didn't quit on her. But she just adapted to the needs, the abilities of the elder. Okay, so meeting people where they are and communication. Here are some of those tips that we talked about earlier. Identify yourself. Use their preferred name. Where are you going to find that? In the chart. Where? Care plan. In the care plan. We're going to find what they want to be called. We had an elder in our mid-stage dementia neighborhood that wanted to be called Betty unless it was by a man. And she wanted to be called Mrs. Smith by all men. I would think that I am called different things by different people, probably more than I know. <laughs> okay, so use their preferred name, be at eye level. Whether it's down on your knee or sitting in a chair, but eye level, maybe even below, make eye contact. Otherwise, the eye contact builds trust. That is a nonverbal way to communicate, to watch the response of their eyes. Sit down with them, listen, really listen, and give them your full attention. Pay attention to, to your body language, because remember, they will always read your body language before they hear the words, before they're able to process. There's that 20 second delay in processing the words, but they will all, almost always immediately respond to your body language. Use visual and verbal cues, both. Observe them for their body language. Listen to what they're saying and respect that. Speak slowly and use short, simple sentences, one step, one step directions. They can't follow others. Be patient. Has anybody ever been patient with you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. People have been patient over the years. Now we're going to be patient with them. Give them the time, up to 20 seconds. Don't rob them of the ability to do things for themselves because you're in a hurry. Be very specific. Ask one question at a time, give one direction at a time, repeat if they don't understand, and do it with patience and love. Ask them how you can help. Tell them what you're doing. Explain what you're doing. Use reassuring touch. Don't be afraid of them, just reach out and touch them. Look for their feelings, laugh. Laugh a lot. Avoid negative words and don't argue with them. You will not argue them into your reality. It won't happen. So we've learned what it means to meet people with dementia where they are. Let's talk about strengths and abilities. In this lesson, we're going to learn the importance of recognizing a person with dementia strengths and abilities as well as their weaknesses and disabilities. Although I much prefer to um, focus on their abilities. So if Tell me something you're not good at. Yeah. Math. Math. Fixing cars. <laughs> Fixing cars. Okay then. Cleaning. Cleaning. <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> I can't do hair. Hair. I have. I had three sons. I have now three granddaughters, and I don't do hair either. <laughs> What else? Is somebody not good at something? Yeah. Everybody is. Yeah. yeah. So does that define who you are? No, it doesn't. No. I mean, okay, if you're not good at, at hair, probably somebody is. But what are you good at? You can cook. So maybe you need to pair up with somebody who can do hair. <laughs> How about you? What are you good at? You're not very good at math, but what are you good at? Managing. Managing. Like you're an organizer? Yeah. Oh, I love organizers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's important, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Does not being good at math define you? No. No. Does 
it help your life that you're a good organizer? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Anybody else? Fixing cars. What are you good at? I'm making friends. Making friends. <laughs> wow. Let's weigh this one. Risk benefit. You're not good at fixing cars, but you're really good at making friends. Let's see. Yeah, so I always have a friend to fix my car. There you go. <laughs> so always have a friend to fix your car. I think that's fantastic. I think that's fantastic. Your disabilities do not define you. Nor does dementia define your elders. We don't walk around and say, diabetes, <laughs> stroke. We say what they can do. That's what we have to do. OK, so we've learned the importance of recognizing strengths and abilities, as well as weaknesses and disabilities with people with dementia. They're still there. The goal of this lesson is to recognize how to connect with someone with dementia. And remember I said it's a progressive neurodegenerative disease. So they change over time. We do that through the basic human needs. Comfort. Everybody needs comfort, don't they? We need to feel comfortable. Is anybody in here uncomfortable? Mm -hmm. I am. I am. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A little bit. I'm hot. I'm getting a little antsy, yeah. 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 A little antsy. My legs may be asleep. Legs may be asleep. <laughs> my feet hurt. Even <laughs> in my tennis shoes, my feet hurt. Any, so we need to be comfortable or we will make adjustments to become comfortable. Mm -hmm. Same thing with your dementia folks. Attachment. So who are they attached to? A lot of times the caregiver. Most of the time the caregiver. They have family attachments. Yeah. They're but attached to certain things. Yes, mm -hmm. like what? Like um, someone who's you know, very far and all times might carry a baby. A baby. So they're, they're attached to things. More. Why do you think someone with late stage dementia would want to carry a baby? Well, because that's probably where she's at. Is she makes her feel comfortable. Had a baby. It makes her feel comfortable. She's nurturing something. It's why I want my dog. Because my dog provides me an opportunity to be attached to something that needs me. Why are they YouTube sometimes? Yeah. We had a lady, like we had all those little real animal things. For real? Yeah. She would not let you take a squirrel from her, but she would throw it on the ground. <laughs> a real <laughs> squirrel? No, it was like a... Oh. It's like a robot one. Mm -hmm. It made noise and moved and everything. But if you tried to like pick it up when she would throw it on the ground, she would at you and try and smack you. So why would she be mean to it? <laughs> sometimes she loved it. Though. Sometimes it just <laughs> she would get mad. Let's at see. Her. Are we ever mean to the people that we're attached to? Mm -hmm. I think we are. I she may have I had high anxiety. anxiety. She may have had very <laughs> high anxiety, and it may have been a really a real blessing that she had that so. instead of. Oh, she That's her. Yeah, she doesn't. She, but it, I would, if I had to make a choice, if she's going to hit me or throw the squirrel, uh, the stuffed squirrel on the ground, yeah, I think I'd pick the squirrel. Well, yeah, I don't know, maybe not. Yeah, they got mad. I guess they were expensive. <laughs> Inclusion. We all need to be included. So if they don't want to do the activity then what are you going to provide to offer them an opportunity to be included in something that is of interest, that brings pleasure to them? Talk about something that they know of. Right. They're going to talk about something that they know and they care about. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's exactly how what it is to be included. But don't sit at the dining room table and talk to your coworker across the, and, leave, and act like they're not even there. That happens sometimes. I hope it doesn't happen here, but it happens sometimes. Occupation. That means there's something meaningful to do. They have a purpose. What happens when no one needs us anymore? We're unwanted. We feel sad. Depressed. Depressed. Most of the time, we'll just kind of curl up and die. 
when nobody needs you anymore? We see that time, I've seen it in my own family members. When nobody needs you anymore, you just kind of give up. So I think it's your job, every one of us who work in long-term care, to tell every elder that we care for every day why we need them. Do we need them? Why do we need them? Well, we wouldn't have a job if they weren't Exactly, here. <laughs> and it's okay to say that. I've that, never said it before. Yeah, that I need you because you provide a place for me to work. That I like because of you. What else? Why else do we need them? Some of them brighten our days. What? They make the day better. They brighten our days. They you teach know, us things. They teach us wisdom. things. They what? They have a lot of wisdom. They have a lot of wisdom. And you know that comes from a lot of experience. Mm -hmm. One of my uh, jobs in my last job was that I had the opportunity to go and interview people who wanted to work, to live at this facility. And so uh, I was given a name and I made an appointment and this uh, couple, was in their home, and I went, I had called and made an appointment, everything, I had my name badge on, everything. I knocked on their door, and this little bitty short guy comes up to the door, and he says, we gave it the office. And I said, oh boy, he thinks he's got a sense of humor. I might not think that, but he does. So we went inside, and I was just sort of doing that break the ice, get to know thing, and he um, told me, I asked when he was, planning on moving. He told me about the 15th of December and that he was going to Hawaii before he moved in. I said, really? I've been to Hawaii, probably won't go back, didn't find it all that fun. And for one thing, it was a cruise and I'm very seasick. And so anyway, I said, what are you, why are you going? And he said, I'm a World War II, I'm a Pearl Harbor survivor. Wow, first one I ever so he told me this story. He was 18 years old. He was on Hickam Field, not in the harbor, but on Hickam Field. He had enlisted. Um, and it was a Sunday morning, and he was awake but not up. And all these big guns were going off. And he uh, was just cussing the Navy for practicing the big guns on a, set, a Sunday morning. And. About that time, he sat up in his bunk and he looked across the room out the window and a plane flew by the window and it had a big red circle on the outside and he didn't know what that meant. Mm -hmm. He very quickly found out what that meant. So he, the, they've exploded the Hickam Field and the barracks where he was and all of those things and when it was over, he went back to the spot where his bunk had been and he had two things left. In the military, they ball your socks up. And he had one ball of socks, and he had the Bible that his mother and grandmother had gone together to buy when he enlisted. And he was going back to Hawaii before he moved into this place to donate that to the Pearl Harbor Museum. He changed my life because I saw somebody that had made huge sacrifices for me, for my lifestyle. That's what we get from them. Yes, we need them. We need them for their stories. We need them for what they were. You know, I tried to tell my kids when they were growing up, you know, I've made some mistakes in my life till this time. Why don't you listen to me and learn from my mistakes, and then you go make your own, you know? No, they wouldn't do it. They made the same darn mistakes I did, <laughs> you know? You can't teach them a thing. That's what we need. We need their wisdom. Okay, so tell them every day why you need them, and make it real. Don't make it up, just make it real. And then identity. They need to have that person inside of them still real. Every day they need that. You need to be able to get that out of them. That should be your goal every day. 
I said this morning that we have these five senses. They still do too. They still do have these five senses. It is an ability and a strength for them. They, their brain has been affected, but those five senses have not been affected. They can still taste. They can, Paco can still give, give me some tapioca pudding with a little bit of whipped cream on top. I will still respond to touch. We all will. Tell me about hugs. You do hugs here? A dementia hug needs to last 10 to 15 seconds. Remember that delay I told you about? Hugging involves putting the arms around and actually making physical contact. And for somebody with dementia, it needs to last, physiologically, it needs to last 10 to 15 seconds so that we can overcome that delay. Sound. Remember I talked about music therapy? What do they like to hear? They probably like to hear their children's voices. So maybe a tape of their children's voices. Hi, Mom. You know, we have devices now that instead of an alarm, it is a voice. And it works the best if it is a familiar child's voice. Say, Mom, probably need to sit down and wait for somebody to come. They'll do it every time. Smell, how many of you are using aromatherapy? No, aromatherapy is one of the most effective interventions in, in uh, dementia care. Well, we do, that's why they uh, are always making cookies and we make our bread yes. from scratch. Yes. The dinner rolls from scratch. Yes. Each, is, each essential aroma has a purpose. For example, we had in our mid-stage dementia neighborhood, we had some weight loss happening. So I went to another seminar. My staff hate that. So when I, I, we came back, we got a, a, just a bath basin, put warm water in it, put washcloths in it, put six drops of essential lemon oil in it. And then they would come into the dining room, we would hand them a, a washcloth, it would be warm, and we would say, now wipe your face, and they would go, Oh, this feels so good. We reduced our weight loss by 22% in 30 days because citrus stimulates appetite. Really? Yes. Cinnamon does, too. Hmm. So all those snickerdoodles that Paco makes, mm -hmm. that not only stimulates appetite, that stimulates weight. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, lavender is a very relaxing, sedating odor. We actually just put one drop of essential lavender oil on, a, on the pillow of people who had trouble falling asleep. They didn't have trouble falling asleep anymore. We didn't have to give them a hypnotic or an anti-anxiety or any kind of med. We just put a drop of essential oil on their pillow. Aromatherapy is very effective. Sight. What? Give me some ideas about some things that we could do that would that they can see that would help their behaviors. Flashcards. Yes, flashcards. Large print. Large print. Now, remember that they're going to have trouble holding sequence. So if you're going to give them something to read, make it simple and not very long. Okay, what else? Colors. Colors, absolutely. Absolutely. So it would be important to know what's your favorite color, mm -hmm. right? Right. Is it purple? No, I think green. <laughs> <laughs> it ought to be purple. Yeah. So, okay. How about pictures? Memory books. Picture, memory books. You have some memory books? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How about journals? Maybe it's not the journal they write, but is a journal that the family and you write? just to kind of stimulate their memory a little bit. Okay, so we're gonna stimulate them through touch, sound, smell, sight, and taste, right? Mm -hmm. Will you try it? Because they work. They actually work. So you're helping Mrs. K eat her breakfast. How can you use this opportunity to meet her need for comfort? Make sure she has something that she likes. Right, and how would where would you how would you know that? Um, 
either look in the clinics or when family members come to visit, kind of speak with them and see what she was used to eating at home or what, what her routine was and she would get up for that morning. So look in the cardex mm -hmm. or ask the family members mm -hmm. and, and just figure out. So what will make her feel comfortable? Mm -hmm. Maybe it's oatmeal. Yeah. You know, oatmeal is comforting to a lot. I hate it. But <laughs> so when I come, don't give me oatmeal or spinach or liver. Now, I will be in the dining room, though, if there is. I can eat oatmeal if it has brown sugar, raisins, and dried bananas in it. I've heard residents say that they usually didn't eat breakfast, so we would always sometimes say, what about toast? You know, some reason, right. Some people just eat toast. Right. And then you know what I would do? So if they just want toast, and that's going to make them feel comfortable, boy, I would load that with some jelly. Because they need caloric intake. Mm -hmm. People with dementia burn a lot of calories. Mm -hmm. Okay. How about attachment? While you're assisting somebody to eat breakfast, how can we foster that feeling of attachment? Visit with them. Mm -hmm. This isn't brain surgery. Rocket science, I guess it is. Visit with them about something that they can visit back with you. Even if they can't speak, if they're in end-stage dementia, if you visit with them about their stuff, their lives, the things that you know about them, they will form that sense of attachment. How about inclusion? Yeah, talk to them. Talk to them. Sit them with people they like or they can relate with. How can you give them purpose? Occupation. At their early stages, you can let them help clean up. Mm -hmm. Yes, they can help clean up. There's no rule that they can't. You may have to go behind them, but that's okay. Go behind them. You can't force them. That's the only rule. You can't force them to work. We need the living room dusted. <laughs> that's your job today, or you'll have to move out. You can't do that. How about just doing as much for themselves as they can and not doing it for them instead of because it's faster? And how about identity? How could we foster that sense of identity um, during breakfast? It's just a simple thing we do every day. Make sure that, you know, their face is always clean and they don't have you know, food all over them, or if they do have, you know, trouble being messy or whatnot, you know, um, just help them do that clean up. Yeah, you know, so keep their face clean and their dignity. clothing clean and provide them with dignity. Absolutely. Don't bring them out before they you brush their hair or they've brushed their hair. I see the most hideous looking people in the dining rooms. Do you ever see that? Mm -hmm. They come out looking like it's been six weeks since, they, since anybody combed their hair and their breath smells bad. And help them with oral care and, and just feeling good about themselves. Give them what they want to eat. If Paco, if they, you were day shift. Day shift, second shift. Okay, so how, um, so with somebody with dementia, how would you know what they wanted to eat? Mm, I asked or when they first come in, we give them a list of families of what they like and don't like. Yeah, and be careful with that. Because they don't want the same thing and every day for the rest of their life. You can tell when uh, you get to know them, what they like and what yes. they don't like. Exactly. And what they eat. Because if you sit in front of them and they don't touch it, then you know them. They they're not like happy that. with it. So then you offer them something else. That's right. Or maybe you even offer them two plates. Which one do you want? They'll let you know. They'll let you know. Okay, so in this lesson we've learned ways to connect with persons with dementia throughout the progression of dementia. It's a progressive neurodegenerative disease. Every person makes a difference. In this, the goal of this lesson is to illustrate the role we all play in making a difference in the lives of the people who live and work. Ooh. Now we've added a whole new perspective.
we not only make a difference in the lives of the people who live here, but we make a difference in the lives of the people who work here, our co-workers. Mm -hmm. We just got through saying we were going to turn them in for abuse, didn't we? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. I hope not. Because I hope together we're going to figure this thing out. So we have 120 beds in the total hospital, but this particular wing has 15. Some of the rooms are single, and some of them they actually share with another person. Shelly, I want you to meet our new nurse, Charlene. Charlene, this hey is Shelly. Nice She's one of our you. best aides. <laughs> uh, oh, don't worry about her. She just yells out like that all the time. She, she can't communicate anymore. I mean, she's fine. Down here, nice to see you, Shelly. Down here, we actually have the new wing of the hospital. Ms. Mueller. It's Shelly. Can I come in? Here, let me help you with this. Uh, thank you, Shelley. Are you okay? I just found out Mrs. Hunter passed away last oh, night. Gosh. The past few weeks I've been taking a little time each day to play my guitar and sing to her. She was the director of her church choir for 40 years, you know. Wow. No matter what happened, she always seemed to respond to the hymns. I am so sorry, I didn't know this. Listen, take a minute. And let me clean this up for oh, you. Oh, no, Shelly, I've got it really. It's... No, honestly, let me do this for you. Thank you. Yeah, she's okay. Yeah, I know. I'll see you in a little while, okay? Okay, I love you too. Bye-bye. Good morning. Hi, how you doing? I'm good. I guess I'm doing okay, thanks. It'll be okay, don't worry about it. Thanks. Hey, good morning. Hola. Latin? Ah, uh, sí, yeah. Oh, aquí. ¿Cómo está? Bueno, bueno, bueno. ¿Y qué? Eh, ¿Puedo ayudar? Eh, no entiendo la explicación. ¿Qué, qué hizo temporal? Sí, no, eso hay un empleado. Ah, ah, bueno, exactamente, bueno. sí. Y quieren saber, o sea, cuánto trabajo tú has tenido. Ah, ok. Bueno. Y tiene que ponerlo todo ahí y todo. Pero está bien eso. Claro que eh, sí. Es difícil. Sí. Son, son aplicaciones que ellos, ellos, ellos preguntan cierta pregunta, pero no es nada, no es gran cosa. Are you trying to see the birds? Can I help you? Thank you. My name is Edna Hopkins. Oh, hi, Edna. I'm David. My mom lives here. She's, uh, <clears throat> she's, 
she's dying. That's the first time I've said that. It's been hard. Sometimes I don't think she's even there anymore. Listen, honey. Let me tell you a little secret. You touch touch your mom. You you talk talk to her real quiet. And then when you look in her eyes, you her son. You see she's still there. She's still there. Thanks, Edna. Thanks. Uh, <clears throat> I'm gonna go say goodnight to my mom again. You have a good night. Take care. So you touch them, and you talk to them, and you look in their eyes, and guess what? They're still there. They're still there. What do you think about what about that video? Very real. Very what? Real. Very real. We kind of did a circle, didn't we? We all helped each other. We all helped each other. The housekeeper. It started with the housekeeper. Okay, so in this lesson we've learned that each of us makes a difference in the lives. And I just want to point out that everybody makes a difference every day. So was it a positive difference or a negative difference? Mm -hmm. It's positive. Mm -hmm. I hope it's a positive. It isn't every day. No. It isn't every day. It isn't in every interaction. But every one of us makes a difference in the lives that we work with and work for. Okay, so in this module we learned what it means to meet people with dementia where they are, the importance of focusing on the strengths and the abilities of people with dementia, ways to connect with persons with dementia where they are, and that you, and you, and you, and you, and you, make a difference in the lives of people with dementia. Okay, are there barriers we need to talk about? Can we make these changes that we need to make to get better dementia care in this setting? Good, good. Touch them. Look in their eyes. They're still in there, okay? Thank you so much. You have been real troopers. I would like to say thank you to CMS for this excellent training program um, with the opportunity to truly, truly change dementia care. We would thank Derby Health and Rehab for hosting us and all these wonderful staff uh, members. I, I thank the videographer, Steve Farrar. I thank people who will, all of the people who will help make the changes. Thank you so much. Thank you.